Good afternoon. This is March the 6th, 2019. Hearing for the Executive Appointments Committee, I am Councilman Robert Stokes, Chairman of the Committee. Also in attendance is President Young. To my far left is Vice Chair of this Committee, uh, Councilman Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To his far left is Councilman Yitsi, part of the Committee. To, uh, to Councilman Bur um, Yitsi's far left is Councilman Cohen, member of the Committee. To his far left, left is Councilwoman Clark, member of the committee. To her far left is Councilwoman Sneed. To his Councilwoman Sneed, far left is Councilman Scott. To my right is Marjor Marguerite Kern, who is um, chair of this um, executive appoint appointments. Again, to her far right is the president of city council, Bernard Young. To his far right is Councilman Costello. To his far right is Councilman Bullock. To his far right is Councilwoman Middleton. And to her far right also is Councilman Reisinger. Also, we, I'd like to acknowledge former Councilman Carl Stokes, who's sitting right here in the back also. To, okay, we have, from the President's office, we have Rebecca Simmons, City Council Attorney. and Michael Huber from the President's Office also. Today we review the following nomination. Mr. Michael Harrison, Commissioner for the Baltimore City Police Department. We have allowed a chunk of time today, today's hearing, but it will still be important that we abide by certain ground rules in order to ensure that we hear from everyone who has come to offer testimony. President Young, do you have any opening remarks? Thank you, uh, Chairman Stokes. Uh, good evening to everyone. Um, the role of the City Council um, in this confirmation process is very important, and the members of this body take that responsibility very seriously. Beginning in late January, in January and over the course of several days, two of my City Council colleagues spent nearly 11 hours in Mr. Harrison's hometown of New Orleans, conducting background interviews with roughly two dozen people who range from elected officials to civil rights attorney to criminal justice advocates. What unfolded over the conversation was an important account of Mr. Harrison's time leading the New Orleans Police Department. I know that that report, which included nearly 300 pages of transcript, has helped members of this committee and the public at large gain a window into the type of manager and reformer Mr. Harrison was during his time in New Orleans. I would like to commend the council for his efforts to create a full extensive and transparent confirmation process. Anything less would not be fair to our citizens. And I look forward to tonight's hearing. Again, thank everyone for being here, and we look forward to a very good confirmation process. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Also, we acknowledge Jeff Morris from the mayor's office and Karen Stokes. But before we begin, um, Karen, you would like to come up to the mic and read a letter from uh, Mayor Pugh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, council members, uh, Karen Stokes, Mayor's Office of Government Relations. Um, we are really excited that this day is finally here. And if I may, uh, you'll indulge me, I'd like to read a few comments from Mayor Pugh. Baltimore City and its police department are presented with a unique and decisive opportunity to turn the tide and <clears throat> embark on a new era of credibility, community collaboration, confidence, and trust. When I submitted for your consideration on February 11th of this year, my nomination of Michael Harrison as Baltimore's next police commissioner, I did so with the firm belief that he was the right person at the right time <clears throat> and in the right place to lead our police department forward and begin this new era that <clears throat> all of our residents have long hoped for and deserve. Throughout his more than 27 years as a police officer with the New Orleans Police Department, Michael Harrison has distinguished himself for an uncompromised commitment to integrity, transparency, proactive outreach, and accountability to the community he was sworn to protect and serve. Acting Commissioner Harrison's commitment Yeah, thank you. 
Acting Commissioner Harrison's commitment to 21st century community-based policing is best reflected by his view that the awesome responsibility of law enforcement officers to police others is ultimately granted not by laws, but by the very people they police. It is his understanding of this delicate balance between residents and officers that uniquely qualifies him for the responsibility I have asked him to assume in this city and at this time of considerable challenge. He understands and has demonstrated throughout his 27 year career that law enforcement is but one among many components in a multidisciplinary approach to reducing crime and violence that likewise requires addressing their root causes. Economic disparity, lack of education and job opportunity, broken homes, neglected neighborhoods, hopelessness. It is his commitment to this approach, which he has already begun to advocate among the rank and file as acting commissioner, that confirms to me the potential he represents to bring about the true healing and sustainable change we need. Michael Harrison successfully led the implementation of a federal consent decree in his native city, New Orleans. He did so knowing that it was the best hope for internal cultural transformation and reform within his department, as well as a blueprint for reestablishing trust between officers and the community. He is equally committed to fully implementing a consent decree that we have made non-negotiable in our administration's priorities. Moreover, Michael Harrison understands the need to exploit the benefits that technology offers our police officers to be more efficient, more effective, and indeed more accountable, ensuring that they have the proper tools and resources they need to bring about peace in our streets, and most importantly, peace in the minds and hearts of our city residents. Michael Harrison, in his nine community meetings across our city, and in his many other engagements with our community thus far, business and faith leaders, has demonstrated his capacity to listen. He is a man of uncommon empathy, keen insight, and seasoned wisdom that can only be gained from years of honest attempt, lessons learned, and unwavering resolve to make a positive difference. Michael Harrison's nearly three decade career has been one that is solely of public service. We fervently believe that Michael Harrison has the capacity and the capability to overhaul, reform, and build a police department that all Baltimoreans can be proud of. I strongly encourage this committee and this entire council to embrace Michael Harrison's candidacy as Baltimore Police Commissioner and to pledge your full support for his determination to bring about the transformation that we all know is possible, but which will ultimately depend on the relentless and collaborative effort of us all. And these are comments brought to you uh, on behalf of Mayor Catherine Pugh. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. Before we um, ask for Mr. Harrison to come to the, the podium, I'd like to acknowledge Ms. Harrison. Would you please stand up? Thank you. Mr. Harrison, you Before we hear from the public, the committee would like for Mr. Harrison to tell us about his background and interest in the position and share your vision for the department. Good evening, everybody. Mr. Chairman, members of this committee, thank you for your time today. And thank you for the, certainly the warm welcome you've given to my wife and me since we've arrived here in Baltimore. It's a great privilege and honor now to be a resident of Baltimore, and I thank all of you from this community and from this city council for the warm welcome. And so thank you for acknowledging my wife who's joining me today. I'm also joined by a number of members from our executive team and our command staff, all of whom are led by our Deputy Commissioner, Commissioner Bonaparte, and I want to thank them for their support in joining me tonight as well. As you know, before be before coming to Baltimore, I served in the New Orleans Police Department for, for nearly 28 years, the last four and a half, heading up the department as their police chief. I consider myself extremely fortunate, blessed, humbled, and eternally grateful now to have been given this incredible opportunity to lead the Baltimore Police Department as I continue my career. My calling, as you've heard me refer to it, in law enforcement, because for me, law enforcement really is a calling. 
Even before my first official day here, I've been working tirelessly to make the Baltimore Police Department the finest department in America. Now, implementing the consent decree will obviously be a big part of the job, and I welcome that. I've had a lot of experience implementing a consent decree in New Orleans, which is now more than 90% compliant, comparatively to other cities which had significantly smaller consent decrees they are much further ahead in much shorter periods of time. I hope to bring many lessons I've learned from New Orleans here to Baltimore, not just to satisfy the mandates of the consent decree, but to change the culture here because the Baltimore Police Department needs it and we need to change it in a positive way. I am committed to reform, not just because we're under federal mandate to do it, but because it's needed, because it's deserved, and because we want to be a great police department. Let me be absolutely clear. The consent decree will not make our officers soft on crime. It only ensures that we do our jobs in a constitutional way. I'm now telling our officers in no uncertain terms that I want them to be proactive. When they see laws being broken, they will be expected to get out of their cars to engage the people and take the appropriate actions. And even when there are no violations, we still want them to get out of the cars and engage our residents in a non-enforcement capacity. Because it's my philosophy that officers should be tough on crime while being soft on people. Good policing is all about three things. Building relationships that were never built, improving on good relationships, and then repairing bad relationships. You've heard me say that before, and you'll probably hear me say it a lot more in the future. Our officers will also hear me say it a lot. It will be in their minds when they're interacting with members of our community. Good police work is all about de developing those positive relationships with members of our community, no matter who they are, no matter where they live, and no matter what they do for a living. Relationships that make our officers better at what they do and make Baltimore a better and safer city. You will see us implement crime-fighting strategies that are data-driven, that inform us about who to focus on, where to focus, and when to focus our efforts. As I was able to do in New Orleans, you will see me foster and leverage great relationships with our local, state, and federal partners in a coordinated collaboration focused on Baltimore's drug dealers and violent offenders, while partnering in a multidisciplinary approach to reducing and preventing violence and improving the quality of life in our neighborhoods. I'm also committed to creating an organizational culture that rewards good performance in addition to holding everyone accountable at every level for poor performance and unwanted behavior. We would do this by implementing the best management practices with technological and personnel systems of accountability at every level that inform us about individual, group, and organizational performance, thereby producing effectiveness and efficiency. I'm well aware that change like I'm talking about is not easy, but trust me when I say it can be done. I've seen it for myself. Not long ago, the New Orleans Police Department was in a similar position to the Baltimore Police Department is right now. In 2012, the Department of Justice referred to the New Orleans Police Department as the most troubled department in America. But over time, by staying focused on our mission, our vision, and our core values, we changed the way the public saw us, and we changed the way we saw ourselves. We also saw significant reductions in crime, and that's what I hope and expect to do here in Baltimore. It's my goal to make our department the gold standard for world-class 21st century policing, a department that everyone in Baltimore can be proud of, and I look forward to working with you to make that happen. Thank you for your time, and at this time, I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Um, what I want to do first, we have five people who have signed up, and if you can line up in the aisle, um, Michael Saunders, Jason Rodriguez, Patricia Truex, Cash, and Dierre Hayes, in that order. Mike, you come up to the mic. So, is Jason Rodriguez here? Patricia Truex. Cash and Diara Hayes, in that order. Mr. Saunders, if you can pull a mic down to your mic so we can. Okay. My name is Mike Saunders. I'm a demolition contract in Baltimore City. I was raised up in East Baltimore all my life. 
I see 1968 wasn't far from here. And I see that as a young man, businessman, entrepreneur man, the census killing have to stop. Mike, in Mike excuse City, me, talking. In Baltimore City. And I think that we should be concentrating on to have some of these young people come to some of these meetings and have some responsibility, try to raise some jobs for these people, opportunity. And I think we could pull the city back together real good because I love this city. I was born and raised here and I love this city. And I just like to see it, it, all the development going on. And I like to see people move back into the city. Not saying, oh, I wanna live in Baltimore City because the crime. I don't like to hear that. I like to put security on the people and get some of these people off these corners and put them to work. And I think we would have a better city. And that's all I got to say. And I wanna say my name to Colonel Russell and Mr. Bonaparte and the commissioner. I welcome you. I just forgot to mention you have two minutes, three minutes since, three minutes, so keep an eye on it. Can you state your name also? Good evening, uh, elected officials and citizens of Baltimore City. My name is Jason Rodriguez. I'm known by the community to wear many hats. I'm the co-founder of the Baltimore chapter of Cop Watch, a policing watchdog group. I'm also the managing partner of the DMV Daily Media Group, an independent news media publication. I'm the producer of the DMV Daily Radio Show. I also produce the Patrick Henderson's Meet the People Radio Show, which airs on every Monday on uh, Radio One in Baltimore. I'm an investigative journalist. I work around the city helping young men and women, um, actually men and women of all ages, to get off these mean streets. Um, I don't call myself a community activist. I call myself a community abolitionist. I'm fighting to liberate my community and its people. Um, I'm here today in opposition of the confirmation of the current acting police commissioner Harrison and to ask the members of the city council to vote no in confirming him as the next Baltimore City police commissioner. My reasons are very simple. He's not from Baltimore City. He doesn't know this city. He hasn't spent any time in the streets of Baltimore City. And when it comes to policing this city, Mr. Harrison has no clue of both the culture of policing in this city, nor does he understand the culture of its citizens. Mr. Harrison has no clue what yada mean, AO means, doesn't know what up the hill, down the hole, EA even is, doesn't know the history of Murphy Homes, flag houses, um, or what EDBI did to uh, a whole community in East Baltimore, or why there's more than 4,000 vacant boarded up homes in Baltimore City, and Baltimore City looks like a third world country. He doesn't know the history of lead paint poisoning in our homes and lead poisoning within our public school water fountains. No, he doesn't know Baltimore City. I could go on and on, but Mr. Harrison coming here to Baltimore City is like me going to culinary school here in Baltimore City, working in the restaurants around Baltimore City for 20 years, then moving to New Orleans and expecting to open up a gumbo and Creole restaurant. I truly wouldn't understand the essence of New Orleans cuisine unless I lived there for many years and studied the culture. Um, a little bit off the cut here, I was in Popeye's the other day, and there was a sign that read, 300 years ago, seven distinct culinary traditions came together to create a uniquely American cuisine called Louisiana cooking. What stood out for me was the, words, was the word uniquely. Louisiana has a culture of its own. New Orleans has a culture of its own. Baltimore City has a culture of its own too and is not New Orleans. We have more shootings per capita, more murders per capita, more juveniles within the juvenile justice system uh, per capita, more children living within foster care, more drug addicts per capita, and I can go on and on. New Orleans is nothing like Baltimore City. Mr. Harrison worked for years in the streets of New Orleans as an officer to identify improper conduct unbecoming of an officer. He identified the culture of bad policing within the New Orleans Police Department and worked to Time. eradicate it. Um, Mr. Harrison has no clue as to the types of misconduct or the level of misconduct that exists within the Baltimore City Police Department and has never bared witness to the racism that exists within the Baltimore Police Department. Racism that has caused dozens of black officers to file suit against the Sir, department. Sorry, time is up. You have other people so, behind you. Thank that's you. fine, but I just, again, I'm in direct opposition 
uh, okay. of this nomination. Thank you. Uh, again, he doesn't you. know Baltimore. Sir, um, thank and, you. You have uh, people we behind have, you. We should have searched locally as far as a council, I mean, as far as a, a commissioner is concerned. Thank you. Thank you. That's all right. We got it. When you come up to the mic, could you state your name, please? Yes. Uh, my name is Patricia Truex. And I'm pull the mic down some? Thank you. And uh, I would like to say that I'm glad to be here. And I um, would like to see better things for the city. I'm in part of the city where I see a lot of things going on. And it's in the west side. That is not the best side of the city. And, um, you know, I'm aware of the crime. And I know we need something to be done about this. We need somebody that's going to be competent to look at the drug problem. We have huge drug problems in this city. They cannot be let go. Uh, the people that are doing drugs and even alcohol, that's a drug too. These people need to be held responsible for their actions. Okay. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Hey, my name, my name is Darian Carter. And we came. Good evening. Hello. I'm the youth. So, good evening, Chair and Council members. My name is Darian Carter, and I'm a part of a group called Family First Entertainment. We're here to show a, a message about how we spread positivity and being yourself at all times to the youth. Some of my team members are here with me today also. Can I say McCray? Yeah, he's. Can I just say something real quick? I, I met these young people about two months ago, and I've been having lunch with them. They do some real positive things throughout the school, and they were excited about meeting the police commissioner. So I told them to come here, and they wanted to just tell you some of the great things they're doing out Baltimore City that the news media usually don't show. Go ahead. Um, we do a lot of things around the city, like hosting various events that promote peace and allow young people the freedom to just enjoy themselves while spreading love and genuinely, like, spread each other love throughout the city, just having a good time. Councilman Stokes encouraged us to come out tonight so we could have the opportunity to share our voice with you all. So thank you, Councilman Stokes. Hello again. And since we don't have a lot of time, one message we would like to leave you with tonight is the understanding that young people are not, young people are not what's wrong with Baltimore City. We are not problems to be dealt with. We are your youth, the future of this city, human beings that have feelings, opinions, goals, and yes, sometimes attitudes. And that is because we are often unaccepted by society. We have so much to say, but not enough people listening. We have so much we want to share, but not enough trust. And we know we have so much to learn, but tools are not easily found. Commissioner, we don't hate the police, we react to the police, meaning we give who we get. We heard a lot of positive things about you and we hope to work together to change to narrative of what young people about this city side by side with the police. I'm an artist myself, but every music that I make is all to spread positivity through the youth. I met Mr. Young before he gave me an award for working with the youth and I also met her before I have received the award. So us on the behalf of FFE, we would like to show the youth that there's nothing wrong with connecting with the police. So on that being said, we would like to be by your side and work with you, Commissioner Harrison. Our next speaker is M. Hood. I, I don't know what the first name, but the last name is Hood. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Matt Hood. Uh, Matt Hood. Mm -hmm. um, I came in uh, here to testify in support of the uh, nomination of Commissioner Harrison. I uh, got the meeting several times at the uh, meet and greets. Uh, he was really receptive to my uh, concerns and questions. Uh, he's taking noticeable action in regards to them, and he could, you know, honestly just ignore me. I mean, uh, who am I? I'm just one man, and what, what, can, what can one man do? But expressed my concerns, action was taken, I was impressed. Uh, I've also noted some of the other concerns here. For example, people have noted he's not from Baltimore. 
But look at some of our other police commissioners. De Souza, born and raised here, came up to the ranks of BPD. He's going to jail soon. Barksdale, another fan favorite from Baltimore. He's one to turn people like Herschel, Jenkins, Keith Gladstone, Gwynn. All these officers that ran wild, ran wild on his watch. Of course, his response is, well, I didn't know they were running wild. The Baltimore Sun told me they were running wild, but I don't know. So be it for Baltimore doesn't tell you anything. Uh, I do have, you know, concerns. For example, um, you know, for example, I saw Sergeant Wars Wardsley, I think it is, running the streets of Baltimore again. The man was accused of stabbing a fellow officer. And I know he's not been in office a long time, but some action should be taken. I mean, if you can't protect fellow officer, uh, BPD officers from getting stabbed in the street, how's he going to protect us? Uh, I'll give you another high-profile example. Councilman Dorsey back in April tweeted about how somebody hit him with their car and BPD did nothing. You know, if they, you know, somebody can take a shot at the you know deputy vice chair. I think it's what are you vice chair of public safety committee. You know, and get away with it without BPD responding. That's a concern. But overall, I'm impressed. Like I said, he works hard. He was responsive to the community thus far. And I, you know, really don't think anything of the fact he's not from Baltimore. I mean, like I said, lots of people from Baltimore, lots of people, and that hasn't really made a difference. Anyway, um, I think my time's up. Any questions? No. You, I no, work no. next door to him. No. I can see him to his office. I work at the shot tower. Okay, thank you. Oh. Appreciate it. Um, we, the council will be start, uh, Mr. Uh, Commissioner, if you would like to come to the podium, or you can sit there also, whatever you, um, and I'm asking our colleagues, and I'd like to um, acknowledge Councilman Dorsey also, Thank you, sir. but the council people, we're going to do two, two questions at a time, and I'm starting from my far left with uh, Councilman Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm Annie Harrison. Thank Good you evening, today uh, for coming before us. Uh, and I know it's been a long, long journey, nine community meetings, but I, I do, I will say I, I do appreciate uh, the commitment to transparency, to uh, engaging in a very arduous but public process. Uh, my constituents have been, I've gotten nothing but good feedback from, from that model and, and, and thank you for taking the lead on that and to the mayor's office for uh, accepting the, the council's challenge to do as many of those meetings as possible. So I know, I know you're a little exhausted, but uh, we almost, almost near the finish line here. Thank you, sir. Um, so Baltimore Police, the Baltimore Police Department is a troubled agency. Uh, this year we have witnessed the federal convictions of half a dozen Baltimore police on racketeering charges, uh, and that was like last year, but during the trial, additional officers were implicated. What steps will you take to root out corrupt police officers in the department? Thank you for that question. Um, you know, I grew up in the New Orleans Police Department, and there was a, there was a headline, and, and I'm gonna answer that, there was a headline, how did the New Orleans Police Department go from being the most corrupt department in America to a model department? It's really about establishing systems of accountability that inform us about good performance and bad performance, about good supervision, bad supervision, and it informs us about things to do and courses of action to take, and then what's to be done when people fail to take those courses of action. And those systems of accountability are both technologically and personnel systems, and creating the most dynamic team of leaders who have will and capacity to lead and manage all the time, and to make sure we're setting those systems to hold people accountable at every level for the performance or the lack thereof. It also requires a robust internal affairs system that has the extremely competent and confident investigators who have autonomy and authority to conduct investigations that produce a, the truth. It's all about getting to the truth. And then have a, a disciplinary matrix that's strong but fair and just that does train and punish officers for bad behavior but punishes also and holds supervisors at every level accountable. The culture is really what's allowed by supervisors and management that allows officers to think that they can do things or fail to do things and get, get away with it. And it really is about changing that culture of holding people accountable, but building the systems that inform us when those things happen, because some of those systems perhaps don't exist right now. And then the systems, both personnel and technology that inform us when supervisors are taking or fail to take the corrective action and then gives me the authority to do what's necessary to set the tone with people in supervision, management, and leadership positions. Thank you. Um, 
Second question I had, and I know we were, I'm going to keep them quick. Uh, on, on this note, um, last August, uh, a police officer who had recently graduated from the academy with awards uh, was caught on video brutally punching a black unarmed man. The attack was so severe that the victim was hospitalized. Earlier this, uh, that year, uh, news reports indicated that the police academy graduated cadets who repeatedly failed tests on constitutional policing. What will you do to ensure the officers receive effective, basic, and in-service training? First of all, very good question. One of the first things I want to do is hire a high-level academic person at the PhD level to make sure that we're bringing in the, the brightest person to deal with this at a higher academic level, to make sure the people who are teaching there have the capacity and the will to teach to know if they've taught before, if they understand adult learning models and scenario-based training and all the best practice and practices in policing, lesson plans, how to deliver lesson plans, how to do teacher evaluations, student evaluations, organizational evaluations regarding teaching, how people learn, whether they're left brain or right brain, whether they're kinesthetic, vocal, or visual learners, how to understand all that so we can apply that depending on the need of the student because the recruit is actually a student in, a higher, uh, in an environment of higher learning. Because when they came to me just a couple of weeks ago talking about staffing at the academy, I slowed the process down to say I need to know how people were selected to be instructors at the academy. Can they teach? Have they taught? Do they have the capacity? Do they understand higher learning? Can they assess students? Can they assess themselves as teachers? Who does that and how are we ensuring that we have the absolute best people to teach? Now, we're working on that, but one of the first things is to make sure we build that system through people and through systems and technology to be able to make those assessments and make sure we have the appropriate people teaching, but the correct curriculum that produces the outcome we want, which is a high caliber recruit turning into a great Baltimore police officer that does exactly what we want them to do and not do the things that, that you just reported to me, which are totally unacceptable. Well, I lucked out because I was going to ask about <clears throat> about the training also, so thanks for saving me a question. Uh, so first off, I do want to acknowledge and, and thank those citizens that did come out tonight uh, to provide their testimony. I do think it is important to note uh, how few citizens came out tonight, and I think that's a testament, a positive testament uh, to the process that the mayor's office implemented uh, for this nominee and for the nominee participating in that. Um, I was present at multiple of those hearings, and I feel that, and I've heard from plenty of citizens that felt that they were able to, given the opportunity to ask their questions, and their questions got answered. And so I thank you, and I thank the mayor's office uh, for that. And, and I thank think that's you. gonna get us out of here a lot earlier tonight than we normally would have been uh, for, for a hearing like this. So my first question uh, is, once, once sworn in, what would be your first item of business? I've already started that, making organizational assessments of what the organization can do and can't do, what it can do well, what it needs improvements on, and then individual personnel assessments regarding the various tiers of leadership at the executive level, at the command level, at the performance level, and making sure I understand what we need and who we need and what skill sets are needed to perform the job at various leadership levels. Um, and so I've already begun making many of those assessments I'm, I'm not complete with those assessments. And so figuring out what we need regarding technology so that we can bring the best practices, much of which will be in the form of technology, but there's an infrastructure gap that needs to be built to accommodate some of the technology that we're going to bring to Baltimore. But then the, the assessment of personnel, who's at the, who's at the executive and command and mid-level management and supervisory level, what those capacities are, what are the gaps and how do we cultivate and groom and develop people to, to grow and fill those gaps, but in the immediacy, how do we find the, the highest level people who have the skill sets to join this team and, and join us in making sure we're leading at a high level to create reform, to deal with crime in real time, to deal with citizen engagement in real time, to deal with quality of life improvement in real time. And so all of those assessments are being made now and when we make those assessments, I can then start designing a plan to, to bring people in, promote people, and assign people based on the correct skill set for the duties. And what would be an approximate uh, time as far as the personnel uh, changes and just overall organizational structure, what would be a reasonable time frame that we can expect to see some of those changes uh, take place, or at least the initial changes? 
I, I think that's a, a difficult thing to, to predict. I want to make sure that's done right. Um, there are some nuances that I have to learn about the Baltimore Police Department. Um, and then the skill sets of the individuals that are already here, making sure uh, that I have a deep understanding of each individual's skill sets and temperament and personalities and will and capacity um, and to make sure that all those things are, are correct. And then there is meeting with the brightest minds within the profession to make sure um, I'm not in a silo, but then the available help that I perhaps might need to make some of those assessments that I can get. I think um, it's in short order, but I can't be really specific about a timeline. It's probably um, months, but I can't really be specific how many. Thank you for that. Thank uh, my you. second question uh, would be around morale. I mean, we understand, and one of the first things that I learned in my first business course in college was if you treat your employees right and you take care of your employees, they're going to take care of your customers. Correct. I think we can all agree we've been challenged over <coughs> the years in making sure that our employees are treated right as well as making sure that they're providing good customer service uh, to our customers, which are our constituents. And so what, I mean, have you gotten a chance to review the survey that I? I did. Asking? I did have a chance. In, in, in our meeting, we talked about it a little bit, but after that, I did have a chance to look through it. Yeah, yes. Thank you. So one of, the, one of the questions was about morale, and what we found is uh, how low morale is uh, within the department. And clearly, I would, I would look at that as a significant priority, and you uh, agreed that yes. that is something that needs to be addressed, um, making sure that our officers feel that they are adequately trained, and that they have the adequate support, and then we need to make sure that they treat our customers correctly and provide good customer service. Because we know when the, you call the police and they come to your house, you're not calling them to say, hey, you want to come for dinner. You're calling them because you're already in distress or you already have a situation. And so how uh, they're interacted with can take a situation in one direction versus another. So what are some of the things that you're looking to do to help boost morale in the department so that your officers feel supported that they can treat our customers and our constituents uh, properly? First of all, a very good question, and I, I've already started that, and I think as I move around meeting with community members, I, by day I was doing the very same thing internally with the department, going to various roll calls at different times, meeting with officers and hearing from them. One of the first steps to improving morale was making sure that there was an open line of communication between them and me, and making sure I actually heard their concerns, not through a chain of command, but directly and that they could actually hear my message, my, my message and my vision that I could give them in a small amount of time directly and not through a chain of command. And the use of technology, I put together an introductory video that I sent to every member of the department to watch over the course of a few days. But then as I made my way around, they were really pleased that I took the time to come and see them and to hear from them. But I wanna advocate with our mayor and with you to make sure we give them the tools that they need and the resources they need and improve the working conditions that we're working in to improve morale. And, and so it starts right there with at least giving them access to their commissioner to hear their concerns directly. And then to begin advocating in a very public way that I'm advocating on their behalf to improve their conditions, to get them the tools they need, to get them the training they need, to revamp the department that gives them not just competence, but confidence to go out and apply what they learn in a very confident way. And I believe some of what we're seeing is just a lack of confidence in themselves, a lack of confidence in the agency to support them when they do the right thing because perhaps we don't always reward the good behavior enough as opposed to always punishing the bad behavior. And it's a fine balance there. But I've been making that clear and I think one of the first steps is making sure that there's some communication from me to them and that they have access to their commissioner in real time. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge um, Councilman Pinkett also. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank Good evening. You. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you uh, for your service. Thank you, sir. Uh, Baltimore is ground zero for the opioid crisis. Each year we lose hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of our citizens uh, to overdose deaths. Most recently, we've seen an increase in fentanyl. Uh, so in the past, we have treated this as a criminality issue. We have incarcerated users. We fought a failed war on drugs. Uh, in a previous administration, we locked up over 100,000 of our citizens, roughly one-sixth of our population. 
Uh, none of it has worked. We're continuing to lose lives to overdose deaths at an astounding clip. So my question for you is, would you commit to ending the war on drugs? How do you think about drugs? And would you partner with the health department and others uh, to really tackle the root cause of this crisis instead of uh, locking up people suffering from addiction? Very good point. I, I am committed to partnering um, with all of our ser social service providers to treat this as a public health crisis, as I did in New Orleans with the New Orleans Police Department, and we'll do the same here by joining the rest of the very progressive forward-leaning departments who really understand the dynamics and treat this as a public health crisis. We will, of course, make sure that because there are people who are profiting um, through the sale of drugs in this extremely competitive market that they are flourishing at the cost and the addictions of other people, and those addictions are ruining lives, people are dying from it, families are being torn apart. We want to make sure that we do our part in being extremely strong against the individuals who are perpetuating and gaining financially off the backs of the people who are addicted. And to make sure our focus is always going after people who are selling drugs where there's a correlation to violent crime because those things will go hand in hand. But we are absolutely committed, and I, as the leader, am committed to working with our public health department to treat this as a public health crisis. We already are doing that work, and we're educating our department to make sure they have a, a comprehensive understanding of a multidisciplinary approach that does just that, treat it as a public health crisis, while not taking our focus off of those who are really killing each other and creating really massive amounts of violence because the market over the, the money of the drugs is so lucrative that we keep our attention on violent offenders and violent offenses. I appreciate uh, the focus on violence. That is an, an, another enormous issue in our city as we continue to lose lives to homicide and uh, robberies, assaults, all of the rest. Um, I do hope to see an end to the war on drugs as, again, I think it has failed in our city. Um, my second question, and we've spoken about this before, but I want to just make sure on the record, uh, we're seeing an unprecedented assault on our immigrant community from the administration in Washington. Uh, in my district, we've had multiple high-profile ICE raids. It's sowed fear in our immigrant community, particularly our Central American community. Uh, I want to make sure, under your department, that the police will not collaborate directly with ICE, uh, will not serve as any sort of immigration enforcement, uh, will stay focused on solving crime. Uh, because what I've seen is when these ICE raids occur, they wear police uniforms, it confuses the community, they don't know that it's not BPD that's doing it, and as a result, it creates a breakdown between our immigrant communities and law enforcement. And so it actually increases crime and makes us less safe because people are not being held accountable. So on the record, I want to get uh, your thoughts uh, and your policy on our immigrant community and the way that the Baltimore Police Department will behave toward them. We have a brand new policy that actually was underway when I first joined the department a few weeks ago that was completed recently that will be under review by the Department of Justice that is really a mirror policy from another city, the New Orleans Consent Decree Policy, which, which gives officers clear, clear and distinct direction on how to deal with members of our immigrant community and that we're not going to be allowed to ask them about immigration status and we're not working or collaborating with ICE on anything that is civil in nature. We only enforce criminal laws when there is a criminal violation that is brought to our attention as a local police department, we will enforce criminal laws. It, it is my personal and professional opinion that immigration is a national issue and should be enforced by the national authorities. I am, and for a couple of years now, have been a member of the National Law Enforcement Immigration Task Force, joined by other very forward-leaning police chiefs in, Amer in America to make sure we have the correct type of policy that helps cities and not hurts cities, because we need information from both victims and witnesses perhaps of immigration communities, immigrant communities, to be able to feel comfortable providing information to us. Otherwise, we're missing out on data about crime that we don't know about. And so we need their help to make our communities safer, and they have to feel comfortable. So, but we have to create policies that protect them. Our new policy, it is just that. 
and it will be under review uh, by the Department of Justice by way of our consent decree team um, probably next week because it's already been completed. So if an officer violates that policy and, uh, you know, we, we did hear a story uh, about an officer that uh, may have inadvertently put placed a call to ICE, uh, what will be the consequence? So then that brings about the, an earlier point and good point of systems of accountability that don't exist that informs us when things like that happen and we have the correct protocols to follow that, investigate that, and then hold people accountable because there's a disciplinary matrix that's aligned with the protocol and the new policy. So as we get a new policy, we then have to design the system of accountability that informs us and allows us to take the corrective action when we learn about it. But there will be a corrective action. There will be, for those that violate that policy, like any policy, okay. there'll be corrective action through training and or discipline. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. I'd like to acknowledge Corinthia Barber, who is the chair of the Baltimore City State Central Committee. Can you stand up, Corinthia? <coughs> and Eric Booker, who is a member of the State Central Committee, 45th District. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Commissioner, and thank you for being in Baltimore because that's how we got to have your wonderful wife. Thank you. <laughs> that we're always happy to see. Um, I have. Um, I have a question. Um, a, a car wash guy was yelling at me the other day. So there's sort of a consensus that you're going to work out just fine, okay? And so if you're if you agree with that, but you're a cranky person, what you're going to yell at elected person is this: Yeah, but he'll be gone in two years. I'll bet you a dollar. I'll stand right here and bet this today. So my question because it's on everyone's mind. Are you all gonna thank you for being here, thank you for living in a neighborhood, thank you for being, inspiring us to, to, to feel confident, and I certainly do. But are you gonna stick around to see, to, to see us all through, yourselves included, the, uh, to a reduction in violence and to um, an improvement and reform of, of our police force. Um, and, and if you are, and I hope that you say yes, because it's a question out there, at least at car washes. I am. Uh, uh, but if so, how will you know, or how are you going to measure, sir, that that we're we're winning the we're winning the game, that we're getting to success with the reduction in violence and with the and the, with the uplift of the professionalism of the force. I think those are two the, the, the se several yes. great questions. First of all, I'm fully committed to being in Baltimore as long as it takes and until my assignment is complete. All and right. my assignment won't be complete until we have achieved uh, violence reduction, until we've achieved full implementation in the consent decree, until the citizen satisfaction has turned around and until Baltimore is function, Baltimore Police Department is functioning at a high level all the time because it becomes a well-run police department. Um, I am, and my wife is, we are Baltimore residents. Not only did I retire from the New Orleans Police Department, but my wife retired and gave up a very, very productive career to join me in this assignment. And so we are fully vested and we are here for the long haul. Now, we will be able to measure success when the department begins to uh, produce more effectiveness, more efficiency. We can produce cost savings. You will see citizen satisfaction rise because I will, in a very near future, commission a citizen satisfaction report that will give us a baseline, and then every year thereafter, citizens will tell us oh, how oh, they oh, feel. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you, but what? A citizen Satis satisfaction report. Citizen satisfaction. A survey. That will, that, an annual survey that will give us a baseline for this year, and then every year will be able to tell us and give us information that informs how we can self-correct to improve that. You'll see uh, consent decree compliance metrics met, um, and then you'll see the, the department become the well-run department that you pay for, deserve, and expect. And then ultimately, when my time is done, mayors from across the country will come to Baltimore and hire its members to be their police chiefs. Amen. <laughs> okay. 
And thank you for being here for the long haul. I am. I mean, I think I, it, we're not all going to be aged by the time it happens, but I think it's going to take a couple years. And well, I hope that you'll stick around and like it so much here that you'll stay even when all the problems are solved. Yes, ma'am. Um, if I get a second question, here's what it is. Do you have goals for the how many officers? All right, we know we're short of officers um, for the police force. Um, do you have in your own mind goals for uh, numbers of, and I know the quality is important in the training, but numbers of officers that you feel you need to achieve at the district level to, that, so we can kind of exhale? Um, that, that's my question, and, and what are you going to do about it? Also good Sir. questions. I, I do have some ideas, but I need to be informed with more information about what we have and what we need, who we have and who we need. And there is a, com a technological component that's missing that when applied and when built and applied, and then we begin to implement best practices and implement good technology that reduce officer burdens and create free time and moving the officers away from paper environment to a digital environment and create processes that allow us to use technology to offset some of the work. And when we civilianize our department to hire civilians and professional staff to do some of the work that police officers are doing, which is happening across the country, but we need to be doing that at a really rapid pace. And then when we use that technology and then when we become extremely accountable and start demonstrate high metrics of efficiency, then we can determine then what the correct number will be. Right now, I would be guessing about a number absent technology, absent civilianization, um, and only going by what has always been. I think when we learn how to make ourselves perform at a high level all the time, holding everybody accountable, getting the maximum output of every employee all the time, you'll see better effectiveness, better efficiency just by those systems of accountability. Then there's technology that offsets some of the work, and then there's civilianization that puts officers back into doing what we signed up to do, which is be police officers, and make sure we hire the correct professional staff to really do the work so that we don't create gaps in the process of civilianization. Yeah. Then, yes. then we can make an assessment right. that things are working well internally, and we can reassess what the correct number should be with all the variables. How long did it take, does it take to get to a citizen in an emergency? How long for a non-emergency? What's the patrol visibility? What's the deterrent effect, displacement effect? What's the staffing measures for special events? And how to reduce overtime by making sure we have the appropriate number working on straight time. There are a number of variables that have to be applied, but first we have to first make sure that we self-correct and perform well bring in the appropriate technology, civilianize, and then reassess as to what the appropriate size of the department should be. I think right now it's immature to kind of go at that and we'll be speculating right now because there's no science or data to back it up. I don't get a third question or else I would say, no, hurry no. up. Okay. Because one of the ways to look to is at the districts and at the coverage that yes. exists Whoever needs to come in to fill it, it's out there, and I know that you are working with all deliberate speed because. But, but, but let me be clear also, it is, it, is, it is at the districts, but it is everywhere in the department. I have to look at every single unit that are non-districts, the homicide, sexual assaults, juvenile, child abuse, robbery, shootings, gotcha. property crimes, SWAT, special things, things that happen in the harbor, um, I need to look at everything to make sure that the staffing is adequate and appropriate and that we're not hurting ourselves in one area to accomplish a goal gotcha. in another area and that is a delicate balance that grows over and that staffing grows over time. But I have to make those assessments so that I can answer your question that we appropriately size districts to accomplish its goals without hurting the capacity in other places. Hurry. Thank you, Councilman. Hurry. All right, thank you. Thank you. Councilman Dewis. Oh, I'm sorry. Here, I'll trade you. It's just long enough. It's just long enough. Um, thank you, Superintendent Harrison. 
thanks for being here. Um, I don't really um, have questions I want to relay here. I have a letter I'm going to give you a copy of. Um, but I do want to just relay, I, you know, one thing. I've had an incredibly difficult time since taking office at um, getting a timely response, if any at all, um, to requests uh, for you know, responses to general things from the police department, um, particularly requests for information. Um, my general sense is that this stems from a department, you know, the department being very aware that it is established as an entity of the state, not an entity of the city, and that it has ag actually no statutory, no statutory obligation to respect this body in any way. Um, and so um, I just want to convey that as a real concern for me, um, that, that BPD should be responsive uh, to request from this body, particularly for inf information as, you know, a department that has no ongoing outside um, independent oversight at all, uh, that, that that stuff is really critical, that our, you know, our efforts to oversee the department in different ways uh, are critical to the public trust of the department. Um, and I would be thankful if you could speak to uh, a commitment, you know, that goes beyond any, you know, I mean, the lack of any statutory obligation, um, a, a commitment to being communicative here. And I can tell you that I have experience with past commissioners who state a commitment to being communicative and then follow through with no communication whatsoever. Um, so if you could speak to that, I'd be really appreciative. First of all, thank you for bringing that to my attention. And so I'm committed to making sure that, number one, you have access directly to me and that you have access directly to those who you need to get information from in real time. And so I think what's missing is a system and a set of protocols that allows a, 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 a systematic way of receiving information and giving information back in a timely manner that is standardized across the department, that has some level of oversight and accountability through technology and people so that when things are asked of us and then we have to produce it back to you, we can do it in a systematic way, in a timely way that has deadlines, but in a professional way that's, that's equitable across all districts, in a police districts and councilmatic districts. And I think building that, I think I'll be happy to share with you and join with you in building something that I think we all can agree on that allows you to ask for information and us to reproduce it to you in a timely manner that's accurate and that, that we have time to actually scrub data and give you good data and not just, not just give you anything but give you what you actually need. Thank you. Um, and just another quick comment is, you know, I've, I've been outspoken as an individual who really doesn't believe that policing is the, a sustainable manner uh, of investing in public safety, that that really comes from people having uh, livable, workable circumstances. I represent a, a very homogeneously middle-class district that has like a third the police resources of anywhere else in the city, you know, of many other places in the city. And we have like the lowest violent crime rates. I think it's a pretty good case for how you know, um, it's uh, housing stability and transportation access and employment opportunity and income stability, that these are the real determinants of public safety. Um, uh, so, and so with that, I just, you know, want to make the point that I pretty firmly believe that the funding level for the Baltimore Police Department is really untenable if we're actually going to assure that the citizens of the city have those other things that are really the, the foundation of, of livability and public safety. And so if you could, uh, in any way, I'd love to hear you speak to uh, uh, you know, the need to reduce the police department's budget in order to be able to better provide these basic uh, livable circumstances. Good point, and I think, I think that's achievable not necessarily with re reducing the budget. The issues that we're talking about are sociological and criminological issues that cause people to be in trauma and actually drive people to crime when those needs are not met. 
we, we all know what they are. Education, drug abuse, housing, jobs, skills, lack of jobs, conflict resolution, all of those things, parenting skills, environmental design schools, all of those things are really important and, and drive people either, either push people or pull people to crime when those needs are not met and, and cities are not investing in that. There could be, with the improvement of the police department over time, becoming more efficient, more effective, because we're going to turn ourselves into a well-run police department that's utilizing the best technology to offset some of the work, utilizing civilianization to offset some of the work of police, and then redeploying police in a way that's most needed but most effective and efficient. There could be cost savings. Over time, when you heard me with the other council member reassess the size of the department over time, however, right now, crime in what we experience now exists in, in in real time that has to be addressed. And so walking into a brand new city and a brand new department that's experiencing high levels of trauma now really kind of mandate that we deal with it all now. As we improve in all of these areas, there could be opportunities to reassess and reallocate, but I would not, I, I, I'm not in a position to advise shrinking it right now, dealing with the issues that are on hand right now. Over time, as the department gets better and the city becomes safer and citizens feel better, and we're moving out of the consent decree, which is incredibly expensive, that money could be reallocated to do many of those things. All right, thank you. I have this letter I'm going to give you a copy of right now. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. So I represent a district uh, in East Baltimore where we did have, um, I think it's a tense environment in some parts of the district, um, but it's probably like that throughout Baltimore City, right? Um, and so I think one of the ways to, um, to make the relationship better between the community as well as the police department are addressing a number of issues internally as well as externally when you talk about what do our young people have? Do they have housing? Um, do they have jobs? Do they have all the tools to equip them uh, to be productive and better citizens? And so one of the things that I wanted to ask you is um, in terms of uh, making sure that um, we are protected because part of the district say yes we want more police and then the other part of the district says no we don't need any more police we just need the officers that are there to just show up when we need them to be um, are you committed to because of the relationship and because of what's been in the news recently um, to uh, stand with some of the community and say, enough with the gag orders, let's really show that Baltimore City and our police officers are on the right track to uh, stop the, um, the victims of police brutality or any accidents that occur with police. I'm absolutely in favor of making sure we stand shoulder to shoulder with citizens to make sure that they feel safe they feel protected and they feel like the department they pay for and deserve can actually perform the duties that are expected of us. I'm absolutely in favor of that. And how we go about engaging the community to demonstrate that we are self-correcting, to be more compassionate, to show more empathy, to get to them faster because we're concerned about their needs. You know, th that's part of a cultural shift that we have to make sure everybody understands and embraces and performs to because you heard me talk about systems that inform us about performance or lack thereof and then what to do about it. And so we're, we're absolutely want to work with that. And I want, I want young people to have an appreciation for, what, for who we are and what we do and not have to go out and then change their perceptions because they think so negatively about us. And I want us to think better about ourselves, but we certainly want to change percep citizen perceptions of police. And this is still part of my first question. Will you um, commit to at least sitting down with me and some of the advocates to walk this through? Because I do think it takes both sides to come up with a compromise uh, to get a solution for both hands. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Um, the second question is more so, do you have the tools that you need in place? I mean, you've been on board for a couple of weeks. You, you got the opportunity to even look at Baltimore before you came to Baltimore. Um, are there any tools that you need right away to help you 
curb the crime, to bring it down, to work with the community. And remember, some of my colleagues have talked about, we don't have some of that power on the city level, and so it needs to be on the state level. So has there been anything that you looked at that you need done on the state level for my colleagues there? I think in, in, in a couple of visits I've had to the state level, uh, we've talked about, like here, what the big picture is. I didn't go down into very granular specifics. Um, but when it comes to what we need right now to curb crime, I mean, right now we need people, we need better training, we need more tools, we need more equipment, there's more recruitment that needs to be done, but there's more retention of the good officers we have that needs to improve. But when it comes to curbing crime immediately, let's remember that those are decisions individuals are making to do that. And while we can be responsive and we reform and become the department we want to be, today a person is actually making a decision to commit a crime. We need to not only change the internal culture in New Orleans, what I need right now is to help to change the culture of violence where people are making decisions to carry guns, they're making decisions to use them, they're making decisions to commit robberies and other crimes, they're, they're bad acts and then retaliations for previous bad acts. The decision point to use a gun is not at the point when the trigger is pulled. It is made when a person makes the decision at home to leave home with the gun. They are predetermined in their mind to use a gun if they need to use it. And the police are far from that. That is a conscious decision of individuals. Now, I need help changing that dynamic. What makes them make that decision? And so the thing we need most is help changing the culture of crime while you give us the help changing the culture of policing. But would the culture of changing that mean uh, for one example, a couple of years ago when we first got into the council, it was, hey, we need mandatory minimums to change the culture of what's happening. We need to hold people on who are carrying the guns accountable. Is that a tool that you see as, hey, I agree with that. That may be something that we may need to look at. I think it is more important to have the certainty of punishment than the severity of punishment. There's an old adage, and it goes back to an essay called Crime and Punishment that is very old, but still applies today, that it is the certainty of punishment that really deters crime, not the severity of punishment. Right now, there's no certainty. People are committing crimes because they think they can. They think they can because they think the likelihood of getting caught is slim, and even when they get caught, they'll get away and get off. And that drives the decision on the front end because there are few or no consequences on the back end. There has to be some level of certainty, and certainly I will work with you to determine what level of certainty and severity it should be so that it's a delicate balance, that it's not overly punitive. But there needs to be something to help shape decisions. So while we reform, we actually have to work to reform the culture of violence among people who are making that decision. But the, and it, there was an article written in a Baltimore Sun that I think um, Commissioner Tuggle at the time wrote that basically said, hey, we're doing our part. Someone else is not doing their part. Like, I think it was blamed on judges or it was just a number of people who, where the finger was pointing at, but it wasn't, uh, it was still no answer in the end. And so I'm just hoping that all of that gets worked out as well with the police department, with the judges, with everyone on board to say, you know, let's hold, you know, repeat criminals. We need to hold people accountable. I'm here to help, I'm here to help fix our department and make us a premier police department. I'm here to help bring violent crime down, but being a well-run department is the prerequisite for doing that. And becoming effective and efficient at what we do will help, will help drive violence, whether we're bringing people in and retaining people, it's, it's creating the well-run department that has high output and high throughput and holds people accountable and lets you hold us accountable. And that's the department that we're, that we're building. But yes, I'm, I'm committed to driving crime down, but I don't want to, I don't want to blame anybody. I want to first look at ourselves and make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Harrison, Ms. Harrison, thank you for being here thank and you, for sir. my colleagues, in particular those who represent Northeast Baltimore. I have to let them know that you are official Baltimorean now because you have had a cocoa crab cake, so that <laughs> makes it official. Uh, C Commissioner Harrison, Baltimore is suffering from a disease known as gun violence, which I believe is directly tied to Baltimore's history of structural inequity. Uh, also, Baltimore is infected with a deep mistrust of BPD as a result of years of bad policy, action, and corruption. How will you, through a lens of equity and public health, work to reduce violence in Baltimore 
while simultaneously restoring the community's trust in BPD? That's a good question, and, and, and I welcome that. It is, it is going to be, when we talk about equity, we have to first make sure we, we have a deep understanding of who we are and why we signed up and why we continue to stay in this profession. I believe the catalyst that really formed change in New Orleans was bringing implicit bias training to the New Orleans Police Department to help us understand our biases. Who we are and how we think and why do we even think this way? And then here are the techniques that the, the world's experts taught us to overcome those biases because they're naturally there in all of us. And then create peer intervention systems and systems that allow officers to do the right thing and prevent other officers from doing the wrong thing and then reward the good behavior instead of having to cover up the bad behavior while building those systems that inform us about those bad actions and what to do about them. Then what to do about those who fail to do the right thing. And it is really about finding people who are willing to step up to leadership positions and then charging them to do that and then training them and cultivating them on how to do it, how other great police departments do it, how business corporations do it, how the military and other people in public government, how they do it, and then make sure we have those best practices, but that we train people to step up and be leaders and be accountable, be responsible, be transparent, but building the machine that informs us when things are wrong and how to take the appropriate action to the thing that was done wrong or the person who failed to do the right thing. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, guns are at the center point of any discussion in Baltimore about violent crime, whether we're talking about homicides or which I believe is a better sign for where violence is going in the city, non-federal shootings. However, while we often discuss, as my, my colleagues just did, the length of time that the person who last had that gun in, in the committing of a crime will receive in prison, there's something else that is rarely, if at all, talked about. Actually, I don't think it's talked about outside of these chambers. And that's where the guns came from, right? So last year, the police department recovered 632 guns that had an origin within the state of Maryland. We know that most of them came without, from outside the city because there's only one gun shop in the city. However, you recover 889 guns that came from outside the state of Maryland. Will uh, targeting gun traffickers and straw purchases be a part of your crime fighting strategy? And can we expect to see uh, partnerships with ATF and other agencies in building cases on these people to see uh, stop the flow of illegal guns into the city of Baltimore? And will you commit with working with us and our state partners and making sure that there are also uh, certain sentences of crime and, and punishment for people that are bringing guns into Baltimore from all across the country? Yes, sir. You absolutely have my commitment to that, to both of those questions. We already have an, a, a robust relationship with ATF and our other federal partners, all of whom I met with in my office last week, um, to make sure I had a, a deep understanding of the roles we play. As a matter of fact, I had my leadership team break down where every single officer was who was assigned to the federal agencies, what their duties are, and what they're working on, when was the last time they produced an outcome, and then how all that works together in concert with the police department's effort to reduce violent crime. The heads of all those federal agencies came in last week and was able to, to, to enlighten and educate me on all of that. How many of our officers are assigned to each agency? What are the roles? What are they working on? How good the, the employees are? and what's needed to move forward and how we continue to work together as I am the now, the, uh, hopefully the new commissioner. And so I was satisfied that there's a robust relationship that we will be able to demonstrate in a public way. The outcomes of the work conducted by not just the federal agencies, but we have quite a few officers that are assigned there that are doing that work regarding straw purchases and tracking where guns come from and tracing them back to their origin, in addition to holding people accountable who are carrying them and using them. Uh, here in the local area. So you absolutely have my commitment to that. And thank you. And Mr. Chair, I know we're doing two questions, but uh, Mr. Commissioner, I also want to thank you for your commitment to both civilization and other police department and changing the way the department uh, responds to calls by using online reporting and telephone yes. reporting, which is something, as you and I discussed, has been very important to me ever since the gentleman sitting behind you, Andrew Smully, and I were staff members in the council president's office. So that's been a 12-year fight, and we look forward to seeing it happen soon. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Councilman Pickett don't want me to say anything. He's sitting on the mic. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Mr. Commissioner. Good evening, Mr. President. Um, you know, my big um, push is for community policing. 
um, having the officers out of the cars, um, getting to know the community and engage in the community. Um, during the time when I was a young man uh, growing up, we knew who all of our officers were on each shift because they were the ones that were there constantly every day. And when they went on vacation, we knew who the feeling was um, all the time. Um, could you describe um, your vision for community policing and how we can have police officers really engage in the community, get to know who the community are? And then um, on top of that, we heard a strong desire from some of the citizens in Baltimore that they wanted someone from Baltimore because you have no connections here. Um, if you could briefly describe um, what you think your connections will be and how you will engage the community. Those are both of my questions because I really don't have anything else. Okay. Oh, yeah, I do. I have one more. I forgot. Go ahead. Yeah, community policing, and, and let me be clear, is, is not a program, and I started by saying what it's not first. It is a philosophy. It is the way we think about how we deliver police services. It is really entangled into everything we do, how we communicate with citizens, the method of communication, how we receive information from community members, but it can only be done through engagement. And so while we call engagement and initiatives community policing, community policing in and of itself is the philosophy. Under the philosophy, you have initiatives like walking assignments, which I heard from all nine police districts. Every single community wants to see more walking assignments. And so I've charged the leadership team to make sure that we get out of the cars, and I asked the question about why they were in cars and parked at various locations. And I was given a satisfactory answer to that, and it made sense for what we got because it was to achieve a different objective. But we want to make sure that we're doing that. It is manpower intensive. When we get out of the car, we're not actually responding to any of the calls because we're on foot. We're doing the things that are really necessary by engaging, introducing ourselves, hearing from the community members, getting to learn their needs and their desires. And, and as I open by saying, it's about building relationships that were never built, improving good ones and repairing bad ones. It can only happen through communication and having honest conversations when we have the free time to carve out to do that. That's what the technology piece is so important. That's why civilianization is so important, so that we can reduce the burdens and give the officers the free time to be able to do that. The next best thing to hiring more officers and bringing them on fast is reducing the workload for those who are already working. The goal of a well-run police department is to have 20 to 30 free minutes on every hour. Right now, we're consumed almost 60 minutes on every hour just answering the citizens' calls. And so we want to make sure we can reduce those burdens, then re build a robust community policing initiative that allows us to do what you're asking by introducing ourselves and being very aggressive in how we engage the community to, to invite them to join us in our community policing initiative. It will be manpower intensive and having lost officers, having a shortage, and having to use overtime and doing all those things have really kind of made us really responsive in nature and not proactive in nature. Those efficiencies that we hope to achieve through civilianization and technology to, to free up time is exactly what we want to do and offset that time into really good policing skills. We want to make sure officers are doing it the right way. So we want to make sure we have really robust training on how to engage and how to listen and really empathetically listen and hear from citizens so that we can deliver what it is they need. You know, we've often said in policing, we give you what we think you need as opposed to listening to you tell us what you think you need and agreeing to deliver what we agree to deliver. And so that's what community policing is really about, agreeing to deliver the services in a way that best accomplishes the citizen's objective and provides public safety. And so all of the comprehensive reform to free up time, bring down burdens, and the best use of technology and the appropriate staffing levels by making sure we have a robust re recruiting campaign, which, which you touched on, which we as a city will be unveiling our very, very robust recruiting and marketing strategy to target and to attract people who live in Baltimore. And for quite some time, every city is dealing with that. People who live away are moving into the city to become police officers. In an ideal situation, in, in a world where we had it just like we wanted, it would be great to have all of our members live in the city where they're police. It is, it is not the reality we live in today. 
But we are working to have a robust campaign that really targets the people from Baltimore to entice them and introduce them to a good police department. But it really will be a high-level marketing campaign that I invite all of, all of you from this council and our media and our citizenry to change the narrative about the Baltimore Police Department because we have to turn it into something that is attractive for people to want to come. We have to turn it into something attractive to make people want to stay, but I, I'm, that's a really, really good point. And there's a lot of emphasis with the little, really bright minds right now focused on recruitment. Now, we've incorporated a recruit stat process that I brought from New Orleans that really breaks down every single part of the recruitment process and holds people accountable for tasks that are assigned or failed to accomplish. And it really lets us know who's doing what and how much time is spent on individual tasks. What are the gaps, what are the breakdowns, and how to fix them. And so over time, we believe we'll get that a lot better. But it is about capacity building, and I, I look forward to sharing with all of you um, in the very near future what we're doing to attract more people from Baltimore to be members of our department. Okay, um, my second um, question um, is derived from an article that I read um, about the LGBT community. Yes. Um, where they were not happy with um, who the selection were to represent their community. Um, you know, we have two um, great officers, uh, Sergeant Bailey and Sergeant Smith, that's already connected to the um, LGBT community. And um, I'm not trying to tell you who to pick or anything, but they're well connected, and I think you need to utilize them as much as possible, um, you know, to look at that issue there, because we heard the concerns from just that one organization um, who expressed that the folk who were assigned to their community were not, you know, were not good for them. Talk about in New Orleans, that is. Yes, in okay. New Orleans. I had the pleasure of have, being invited to a meeting this week, just the other night, with our LBGTQ community, with Sergeant Bailey, who hosted the meeting and invited me. And we had a one hour meeting just this week, very productive. They laid out a number of concerns and I laid out some big vision items uh, to them, how we hope to work collaboratively to address their concerns on a regular basis. But excellent point, and I'm certainly thankful uh, for Sergeant Bailey taking that initiative to host that meeting early in my, in my administration. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. I have another one, but I'm, I'm down to the two. Yes, sir. Um, Commissioner and Mrs. Harrison, uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, sir. On behalf of hundreds of constituents who've reached out, um, we don't just want you here, we really need you here. So thank you. Uh, first question is around customer service. Um, I want to take a step beyond just the police community relations piece. I do believe, as I've mentioned to you, that we have a serious customer service uh, problem with the police department. Um, that is everything from uh, when police officers follow up uh, with citizens to the information that uh, police officers, whether responding or at the station or um, our, our operators at 911 recognizing that's not your issue, uh, the information that they give is sometimes inconsistent. Uh, and it's something that I think is at a root of a lot of the issues in the city uh, with the police department. Um, what are your plans to address that? Thank you for that. I am so, so concerned about customer service and delivering excellent customer service. And, you know, first impressions are lasting impressions. I want to make sure that we, first of all, when you think about policing, people will often say it is protect and serve. It is actually to serve and protect. And we wanna make sure that we are offering excellent customer service and the citizenry and our visitors to Baltimore are our customers. Um, and I would hope that through citizen satisfaction reports that gives us a baseline of how citizens feel with their interactions over the police department, those survey results will drive how we can create metrics and how we can create systems and pathways to improving that citizen satisfaction. Who we need to bring in to teach us the model of how to engage. Um, right now, we want to make sure that when we meet citizens, we're introducing ourselves, we're explaining to people what it is we're doing and why we're doing. It's the concept of cross policing called procedural justice. Just making sure that we apply procedural justice to everything we're doing really satisfies a lot of citizens' concerns that they at least leave the interaction knowing who that was that they interacted with and why the interaction existed in the first place. I think that really solves a lot of it, but in procedural justice by way of the consent decree and just being a national best practice, 
That's what we want to make sure that we're doing. Follow-up is a big thing. I heard that at every single community meeting. Citizens would have issues, and some of them were even good, but the lack of follow-up from a detective or from a supervisor about the outcome of what was brought to their attention, citizens really had a hard time because they didn't like the, they actually were okay with what happened. They, what they really didn't like was that there was no follow-up. Um, that's all part of customer service training, and I'm committed to making sure that we find the best that applies to policing and make sure we get that and deliver that across all ranks. Thank you. Thank you. Second question is around the bureaucracy of the Baltimore Police Department. Uh, we all know how large the budget is and the number of employees. And the larger an organization, the more challenging it is to navigate uh, bureau bureaucratically. Um, there are a number of areas that have been hampered by this bureaucracy. Uh, recruitment, deployment of technology, uh, deployment of city watch cameras, uh, procurement. Um, what are your plans to address that and can we count on you being a partner with the council when we raise those issues to your attention to make sure that the right people within the department get the directive from you that we need to cut through the bureaucracy um, and we need to do things in order to put the police department in a better position to serve the citizens of Baltimore. You absolutely have my commitment. I, I see that as a two-part issue. It's, it's, it's systems that either don't exist or systems that are not effective and efficient that inform us of what's being done, who's doing it, and with deadlines and outcome metrics. And then there are personnel performance issues. Do the, right, do the people have the right skill sets to perform the tasks that are assigned? And are the skill sets beneath the expectations that are expected for a person to perform? And so we have to make sure that that we marry the skill set to the expectation so that we can have the desired outcome, but that we build the system that informs us. The system may be personnel, but the system may be technology. And both have to really work well together. But the technologies have to be able to communicate, interface, and synchronize with each other. And so I want to be cautious about buying something or building something that either the council cannot see, your technology doesn't synchronize or read with it, our other technologies within our department can't synchronize or interface or read with it. And so that's an entire tech technological assessment that has to be done by an expert that is not me, along with the personnel skill set at high levels, especially when it comes to those, those really management skills that, that we assess all those skill sets of everybody that's, that's within that bureaucracy or under that pipeline of employees to make sure everybody has the right skill set to perform the expected task. Those are things I'm really concerned about, just like you, that I hope to, hope to correct and perfect. Uh, good evening, Commissioner. Good uh, evening. We really appreciate you taking the time to meet with members of the council individually, but also with uh, members of the community in a group setting. Um, clearly, Baltimore is not the same city as New Orleans, um, but I believe there are some lessons learned. So um, another city that was also under consent decree. So can you talk about um, your ability to reach some of the benchmarks in that consent decree and how you would apply that uh, here in Baltimore and some of the lessons along with that? Yeah, thank you so much. The the Some of the reaching some of the benchmarks there were, were really tough. I think part of it was really community education and internal police organization communication and education on what the consent decree is, what it's designed to do, and how we move from the very beginning through implementation all the way to monitoring, and that the community has a clear expectation. Right now, we're actually building a machine. So the machine is not yet able to produce a lot of outcomes because we're still building the machine, but once we build it and turn it on, then it begins to produce outcomes. And so, but there has to be performance metrics and communication about what we're doing in building the machine. And so, but picking the right people and creating the right dynamic team of experts that know how to manage and lead and create buy-in and change the narrative. And so it's a communication strategy, it's a technology implementation, it's high-level personnel, it's systems of accountability that are working, it's, it's high discipline. That, that alter behavior on the front end. And just like we want strong consequences for people in the community to, to deter them from committing crimes, there has to be strong and certain consequences for members of our department to deter them from committing bad acts and to perform at a high level. But we gotta focus on reward for good behavior as well. And I think equally rewarding good behavior, rewarding buy-in, and changing the working conditions and the, the organizational culture is, is really, really strong but it takes the right team of leaders who have buy-in, who have the capacity to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Greetings, um, Greetings. interim Commissioner Harrison, to you and your wife. 
Um, I know that you endured nine uh, strong community meetings, even through some of those days we had some terrible weather, but you turned out and uh, a number of people in the communities turned out as well that yes. showed, um, it showed how um, interested we are and how in need we are with help in our city. Um, as I was sitting here, I, I noticed that you made a statement again that was a statement you made at the very first community meeting uh, that I attended, and you mentioned at the first meeting that crime starts well before the crime is committed. And you gave, um, an exa the example you gave that night was when someone, decided, when someone decides to leave their house and pack a gun in their waistband, they have already made up their minds to commit a crime. So I, um, I know you elaborated on some of this, but um, I guess to try to take it a step further. What is your approach to reach our youth and even some of our adults to curb that type of thinking? Is it through outreach, partnerships with school and churches, the business community, or a combination of all? I know that, um, and forgive me if I get your title wrong, Colonel Russell, I know you take a strong group in the summer to a camp with our youth. I know I, that just came off the cuff of one way that I know you're reaching some of our youth, but do you actually have a strategy you can share? So it is, thank you for that. It is, it's actually a combination of everything you mentioned. And so while we are charged with, with being the police, certainly we can have programs that are community policing oriented and personnel who are mentors and coaches and advocates and working with, with young people to change their perceptions of police. By changing their perceptions of police, we actually change their perceptions of why they need to do what they do and we actually curb their decisions to commit crime. So those are programs within the department, but we have to be good partners with all of our social service providers and all of the recreational things that are available and should be available to kids to make sure that they see us in a non-enforcement capacity. And so yes, there are programs in the department that's probably a finer program, one of the finer ones. But we have to be good partners with those who have other programs and then show ourselves in a non-enforcement capacity because when they only see us in an enforcement capacity, they create perceptions of us. Those perceptions kind of help them in their decision making. And by showing ourselves as human and regular people, being able to talk to them, once we can develop that trust, they're more apt to listen and perhaps take some advice. But yes, we have to really partner with other entities that are providing those services and really treat this in a non-enforcement way. There are times we will have to enforce because some of our youth will do things that require us to do that. Um, but I'm really interested in making sure that we're building relationships with youth and changing how they view us, hopefully to change how they view the youth of our, of our generation so that they can be an inspiration and be mentors to other people to help them create a pathway away from bad decisions. Mm -hmm. And then my last question, um, some time ago, we uh, worked for many years on this uh, manual, I guess I'd call it, uh, Transform Baltimore, which many of us know, and uh, which is a zoning code, and it, um, we really updated it, the, the whole manual, and, um, there were some ordinances in the and a, a number of things we as council members thought of ideas on updating certain ordinances within that manual for enforcement, particularly um, police enforcement. And um, of course, I remember three that I kind of put in and I think that you and the police department really need to be aware because I think it's really gonna help some of the neighborhoods. One was um, window exposure in the businesses, and you supposed to be able to a police officer supposed to be able to see in the business. So there's a certain percentage that is required. Um, there was something on drug paraphernalia, how um, it was exposed in in the, these corner stores and so on. And the, now there's a, a ordinance that they cannot be exposed that way or mixed with candy and stuff. They have to be behind the counter and a person has to ask for tops paper or whatever. 
And then there was another one on dangerous knives where we know that three, the legal knife is three inches, but at um, gas stations and so on, those knives were strategically placed with candy and the knives have glossy neon handles. They are not supposed, they're supposed to be behind the counter as well. I um, just, uh, I think that it's time for the police department to really start at when you do your foot patrol and things like that, that those are, and th these places get fines. So or do you plan to um, work to try to really enforce those, uh, your I, comments? I, thank you for that, and I do. And to some degree, some of that work is already being done. As I walk through the neighborhoods on our VRI walks with the commander of a particular district and the mayor and all of the, the city agencies, we're stopping at neighborhood stores and I'm being enlightened about actions that were taken against a store that were in violation that are perhaps now in compliance and we're now seeing some stores that actions are taken and uh, they're being sanctioned. And so some of that work is actually being done by the various public city agencies, code enforcement and some of the other agencies by way of police making them aware of that. And so to some degree that, that's being done. Can we make it more robust? We absolutely can. Mm -hmm. Can we improve on our community policing initiative? Because once we kind of self-correct in that area, that, that could have some positive effect into what's happening in and around the store. And so yes, I'm absolutely interested and committed to working on that. And then just to piggyback and end it, um, you know, spring is approaching and you know we have a very robust dirt bike issue here in our city. So I don't know if you've been briefed on that. You have a smile on your face. I don't know if you've been briefed on that or- I, I've been briefed on it, but okay. it, it's, that's a dynamic that is, uh, that is spreading across America. Mm -hmm. We had it in New Orleans and um, it's, it's a challenge for, for police chiefs and law enforcement executives across the country to make sure that number one, we can deter people from doing that but then we can engage them without creating more harm to having them have accidents and fall off their bikes and car crashes. And so it's a balance of how to enforce and how to do it safely. That's always a concern for chiefs, but we don't want to just let them get away with it. We wanna make sure that we can enforce it and do it safely. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioner. Good evening, sir. Um, I think at this point, probably every question that could be asked has already been asked, but um, of course, uh, I'm an elected official, so I'm going to find at least one question. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, um, sir. But <laughs> I want to I personally thank you for um, uh, joining in on a uh, prayer walk and vigil that myself and Councilman Costello had last week along with the, the Archdiocese of Baltimore. Thank you for um, hitting the ground running. Um, the, the outpouring that was shown um, that particular evening, I think is a, was a symbolic that uh, the citizens are ready to be engaged and ready to be used to um, make certain that our communities are safe. Um, and, and I know you've talked um, quite a bit about community engagement, can, but can you speak specifically about um, any initiative, any plan to really um, activate the faith community in a way to really help make our community safer? Yeah, good question and thank you for that. And I had an opportunity to meet um, I think somewhere around 100 faith leaders, uh, 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 not this week, but last week, um, who really wanna be engaged. And we wanna make sure that the members of our department understands the value of uh, interacting and joining with faith leaders. Um, it is one thing for me to be able to partner with faith leaders and, and, and have meetings and attend services and have them come to my office. But I think it is equal, if not more important, that at the executive level and at the command level on the ground where the churches are, that not just the commander, but members of the supervisory team and the officers really get to know who the focal community leaders are in their community, which by and large are the faith leaders. It is one thing for me to have that relationship, but I really wanna make sure that they have access to their district commanders, their own first name basis, that the faith leaders can pass on messages to congregants on a weekly or daily basis or monthly basis about things that are happening in their district and what's happening because a lot of times good messages are lost because we're not effectively communicating and then when bad things happen we communicate really well and so I want to make sure that 
Um, all of our faith leaders have access to all of our members, but I want our team to be proactive. I do not want the dynamic to be we're only accepting invitations from our faith leaders, but that our faith leaders are actually accepting invitations from us and that we are being proactive in identifying those leaders, approaching them and making sure we, we're accessible and available and willing to be good partners and invite, and invite ideas because there are many times they're going to have good ideas because people by and large trust their pastor. They trust their faith leader more than anybody else in their life with the exception of their immediate family. And so that's great value. I believe in what has worked in New Orleans, what I believe can work here, there are times citizens will have information about crimes that they, because of a lack of trust, will not tell us, but they will tell their pastor. And sometimes that can be a great alley for information and a conduit to provide information that we would otherwise not have. Um, because a person who might be vulnerable or who might be uh, in, a, in a life of crime may not go to church, but he has family members that do. And there are times we can learn things that we need to know, but there are times we might be able to reach them by just having a good relationship. Because if your pastor says, let me introduce you to the district commander, you may do it. And that's a value because they are the most respected leaders in the community. That's one initiative um, that, that worked, and some are better than others. But that's one that I thought that worked very, very well. But I want our team to really have a, a deep-rooted understanding and a compassion and a capacity to embrace a kind of a new way of thinking. Instead of just relying on people to give us information, there's a way to get it that really builds relationship and builds trust and accomplishes the goal. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Wow, I get my turn. Thank you. I just want to, um, you know, you have your community relations council in each police district. Yes, and sir. when I talk to my seniors, I know my colleagues know that also, they, they, they are scared to come outside because of the crime in this city. So I want to know if a commitment from you that the CRC sometimes come out of the police buildings because people that get arrested don't want to go in there. And people that's not arrested don't want to go to the police station. And I think you want to build a trusting, um, safe relationship with our seniors that our CRCs go to some of these senior buildings and have your meetings there and build that trust. Because a lot of seniors don't even want to come out their door, they, wherever they live at in the senior building. So can I get a commitment from you that the CRCs sometimes on their schedule go to some of our senior buildings? Because our seniors are scared, and we need I'm to build that I safety am absolutely with committed to that. And, and let me add, because that's actually a good point. They're not scared to go to church. But they're scared to come out the door. I, 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 I'm absolutely committed to that. First of all, I think that's a good idea. And I think we should move away. And in New Orleans, um, there were times we hosted community meetings at the station, but we moved it to public libraries. We moved it to other community centers, and then we moved it to kind of open spaces sometimes. And I think it's just good to get away from the police station and, and have community meetings and gatherings in other places. I, I, I think that's a great idea. I would encourage all of our CRCs to periodically do that. It actually makes us more accessible um, and, and we're really available and offering more opportunities to people who otherwise can't or wouldn't go to a police station. My others, um, maybe about a year and a half ago, I introduced a, a resolution about police contraband. And before I came on this council, I used to hear people talk about what happened to the guns, where did they melt them up? Councilman Scott talking about illegal guns back here in Baltimore and working with Chief Odell there's a process, a five-step process, but is any way that could be streamlined? Because that's a long process. It's not transparent. We don't know when you're, you're going to melt the guns down. A lot of uh, community want to see that, how that process works, how you select the guns, and where you go at and see them melt it down. My other question is, when you talk about guns and money, the transparency in terms of police sees the contraband, the money, there's no transparency on your website to say how much money that you actually have um, from rage and that, and why is that money not put back into the community? Because uh, I hear about y'all buy tasers with it, but we could use that for some safety programs in some of these communities that have a high rate of violence. Um, so is it any way that that can be, that process be streamlined? Because it's a long process. And I, could you look at that at least and see how we can streamline that also? Yeah, we'll absolutely look at both of those. Number one, the, um, the, the issue with 
the, the destruction of guns that we get. That's certainly an, an easy fix to create, uh, once again, a system of accountability that shows what we take in, how long it was there, what we did with it, how it was disposed, and then creating a level of transparency that satisfies uh, public concern, public and private concern. I think that's an easy, easy fix. And the next issue you talked about was um, the money, the asset forfeiture. Right. Yeah. Now mm -hmm. we, we're required to file. There, there are two types: state and federal asset forfeiture. But there are certain laws that apply and are somewhat different of what can be or should be done with that money. It could <clears throat> be put back into circulation for a department through purchasing of equipment and training. Uh, and other resources to further produce more outcomes from law enforcement. Um, I, think, I, don't, I think it has to be used departmentally. I will check and get back to you with the exact answer of what the law allows for and what we're prohibited from doing with, the, with those Just funds. Just one other thing. Um, because of the opioid problem here in Baltimore mm -hmm. City, I want to work with you um, with the hot team, yes. um, social service, the mayor's office on homelessness. Um, continuum care, Hopkins, city, state department, how we create, because if you look at the hot team, there's only two ladies to cover the whole city. So using Hopkins as a pilot program, so when the hot team is somebody they pick up off the street, most agencies are closed. We use Hopkins as a pilot program. They had a hub built there at the hospital. So the referral will come from the hot team, but the agencies will be available to deal with the opioid problem. So I would, with my staff, to put all, pull all that together and like for you to be a part of the Absolutely. conversation. Absolutely. Okay. Looking Thank forward you. to it. Uh, Council Beaver, this is one question now. So I want to refer back to something that you said earlier, Mr. Commissioner nominee. Uh, you said the certainty of being caught is vastly more powerful than deterrent of a deterrent than the punishment itself, uh, and I, or something like that. Uh, so I, I certainty I looked over it up. severity. Yeah. So I looked it up uh, and found you know that's actually a lot of academic research that supports that, um, and, and it's something that I, I happen to agree with. So I wanted to get your quick rapid fire. Uh, positions on three very hot topics that have come through this body uh, in the city of Baltimore recently that relate to that. Um, so one, uh, I think that also applies within the department. Uh, can you state on, for the record your position uh, on sharing as much information as possible in a timely manner with the Civilian Review Board? I, I'm open to making sure that we are transparent in everything we do. And to the extent that the law provides, I'm certainly in favor of being transparent of what we do, especially, especially disciplinary records where cases are proven against an officer. Not the ones that are not proven, but things that are proven against an officer. Certainly being transparent about that is a strong mechanism that in New Orleans built trust and making sure that, that we were always open and transparent with the actions taken by an agency when when it was found that the officer actually did what he or she did. Uh, what is your position on the recent announcement by State's Attorney uh, Marilyn Mosby on the prosecution of marijuana possession? I, I certainly understand what's happening there. The law has not changed, but there was a policy change within her office about not prosecuting, and that's really a dynamic happening across America. We kind of experienced that to some degree in New Orleans, where it went from decriminalization and state court to decriminalization with a municipal affidavit being being affixed with a small fine. And so, but the Baltimore Police Department over time has already decreased its arrest through decriminalization and through just best practices and then focusing on violent offenses rather than nonviolent offense. Although I do, we did meet on my very first day uh, here in Baltimore and talked about that and agreed to a pathway to accomplish each other's objectives when each other's policies tend to conflict with the other person's policy because our policy is aligned with the law. And the law didn't change, but her policy changed. So we agreed to move forward on pathways to achieving those objectives, although I fully understand that dynamic. I want to make sure our department is focusing on violent crime. However, I want everybody to be clear in our department and in the community that we always want to make the distinction and know the difference between the violent offender and the nonviolent offender, the violent offense and the nonviolent offense. 
And while simple possession of marijuana is a nonviolent offense, it doesn't always mean the person caught with simple possession of marijuana is a nonviolent offender. I just wanted everybody, you know, I wanted her, and, and I made that clear to be clear of that. Circumstances may from time to time necessitate an arrest, although our department has already moved away from arrests on simple possession of marijuana. And, and final, uh, I promise I'll stop here. Um, what is your position on mandatory minimum sentencing for gun possession? I'm in favor of the certainty of punishment. And if there is a mandatory minimum that has to happen to create that certainty, I want to make sure we have the tools to change the culture in society as we change our culture within our department that move people away from making those bad decisions. I want to make sure that people are deterred from it because they fear the punishment, because they fear the, the, the certainty of punishment. Here's what happens here's what happens in the mind when people decide to commit a crime. They say, well, if I do this, will I get caught? If I get caught, will I go to jail? If I go to jail, will I make bail? If I make bail, will I get out? If I get out, will I go to trial? If I go to trial, will I win or will I lose? If I lose, will I go to prison? If I go to prison, can I handle it? They ask themselves all that questions in a fraction of a second and then they choose. And we want to make sure that they choose wisely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, council persons, one question. I had two, but I'll, I'll save my second one for the next round. Um, <laughs> There's not going to be a next round. This is oh, this it. is it? Uh, yeah. Oh, that's why he threw in three. Okay. All right, I'll ask, uh, I'll ask one question as far as the public's concerned. Um, the gentleman over, over here to my left, I think he said his name is Mr. Rodriguez. Is that accurate? Yes. Yeah, he, um, he had testified uh, in the beginning, and he asked a question, which, <coughs> frankly, I didn't hear the question asked at some of the public hearings that, that we had, and so I was just curious on your answer uh, about – how you think the dynamics between whether you're from Baltimore or not uh, being from Baltimore, and obviously not from Baltimore, so you have a unique set of experiences from New Orleans, but how do you, how do you think that um, you know, that's either an asset or uh, some challenges that come along with, with not being from Baltimore? Well, there are always going to be challenges when a person who is not from a particular city comes into a city and tasked with a big thing like running a, a large police organization, an organization that that is in the middle of some challenges that perhaps is in the middle of a federal consent decree. But the experience I bring are, are very parallel to what, what's happening here in Baltimore with violent crime and a, a, a major city, a major American city being in a police consent decree. Um, and so the dynamics really parallel. And so what I found in talking to the members of our community that I now live in is that they want the same things the citizens of New Orleans want. They want safety, they want a nice neighborhood, they want good schools, they want restaurants and supermarkets in their neighborhood, they want a responsive police department, and so the things they want are the things I've experienced and delivered in New Orleans. And as I talk to the police officers, the police officers want the same thing. We want people to, to really embrace us and to respect us, and we want to be able to serve our community, but we need the tools to do it. We need the technology, we need pay, we need, so the officers are asking for the same things, the citizens are asking for the same thing, and it's really not that dissimilar. I find that there are very many parallels and similarities, and it's really all about leadership, the ability to motivate people to do things that they either don't know how to do, don't want to do, or don't understand, and it's really about effective and solid leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Chair, uh, again, Mo thank you. Good evening, thank you. Hanging in there. Uh, so ongoing is the uh, implications of the gun trace task force and the misdeeds that they committed just yesterday we had some more rollout from that yes. uh, that represents a major stain on this department on our city uh, it undermines faith and trust in law enforcement and in the law uh, having officers that were quite literally robbing people robbing drug dealers uh, can't get much worse, but I want to know specifically what you plan to do to prevent any further uh, misdeeds among this department. Uh, what are you, what policies are you going to put in place uh, that will ensure that we have the accountability to know that we don't have rogue units that are participating in illegal activities within the department? Good point. Um there, there, there are a number of very specific things that can be done, but utilizing what we already have is going to be key also. But it has to be the recreation of policies, which is already underway, but the recreation of a disciplinary matrix that's aligned with those new policies, that it's aligned with the training that's out there, 
but it has to have strong consequences, just like we want for the citizens who commit crime. It has to have strong consequences for our members who commit bad acts. But it has to have good management, supervisor and management practices in policies in management, but then consequences there for people who fail to take the corrective action. Then there has to be strong policies and consequences for people who are watching things happen and failing to take corrective action. But it has to be something that we brought to New Orleans, a peer intervention program that allows officers to step in and stop the bad acts from happening in the first place. It's all founded upon active and passive bystandership that we implemented that actually saves careers. And when we implement that here, which believe it or not, the Baltimore Police Department has already been to New Orleans to learn from it, and we've already attended conferences to learn from it. And so that's coming to have officers teach each other how to step in front of their colleagues and even in front of their ranking officers to prevent the bad act and then we learn and recondition ourselves to reward that good behavior instead of always having to punish the bad behavior over time with strong policies and strong discipline but just and fair will shift culture and then you'll see more officers doing that to save careers instead of having to get fired and suspended like I did yesterday with four other people for knowing about it and for their participation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Commissioner, what do you, you, you've been here for a while now. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, and you've had a chance to um, see the, to get some glimpse and uh, view of the Baltimore City Police Department. Yes, ma'am. So what three things about it do you like the best on your first impressions? The police department. Well, first of all, every, from what I see, everybody really wants to do a good job. They want to do a good job. People have a lot of energy, and I think there's a newfound energy. I don't know if that's because I'm here, but right now there's a newfound energy. Um, we uh, we and, think so, maybe and, and, that's part and, of it. They're very honest about what needs, what they think needs to be done. And as I go around the department, they've been sometimes brutally honest, whether it's technology, whether it is management, whether it is politics, they have been brutally honest on what they think the issues are and have charged me to go and correct them on their behalf. Um, so, so I like that about them. And, and they've been very welcoming and they want to be a good police department. They want to have a better police department. You know, they're, they're, they're longing for it, they're crying for it, they're asking for it, and I, I think that's encouraging. So um, I wasn't really surprised, but I was really, you know, pleasantly surprised to find that they, they want change, they want reform, they really want to be good. Um, sometimes we don't know how to go about doing that. Right. And I think now is to create the correct pathway to doing that. Thank you. Thank you. That was, my, that was my question that I was oh, going to no. ask. So, um, really? <laughs> it was. So That's good. I how he likes Baltimore. Yeah, throw, throw it back here. I got one more. <laughs> no, my colleague to the left of me has about four, so I'm going to let him go. <laughs> do you have anything, Ryan? He had a question. Oh, he did. Yeah. This seems just kind of perhaps a variation on questions that's already been asked probably, but just if you could speak to the... Um, perceived relationship between uh, kind of the internal external cultures of the blue wall of silence and stop snitching you know that's a dynamic that I think every chief in America is dealing with right now and um, that there, there are two distinct cultures and the, the the cultures almost kind of rely on each other to survive and so while in the street and out there among people who think that they should not provide information that they call snitching, we really have to learn to change that dynamic because it is, it is their safety we're actually trying to provide. And so we wanna make sure that we can change that culture. I don't think it's easily changed as long as they have negative perceptions of the police department and that the techniques we use to obtain the information are questionable in the, the things we do to not protect them or the things we fail to do to protect them, which is not always in our control. But I think we have to look at that holistically. How do we get information, how we treat people, how we provide information to those who give information, and how we reward that and, and, and protect that over, the, over long periods of time in partnership 
with the state's attorney, with our federal government, with other state agencies, for-profit, non-profit agencies, how we go about doing that. So it's really a holistic conversation that we have to have. But the blue wall of silence, you know, that's a culture that we have to change, but that's what I mean by creating peer intervention systems that we will bring here to teach officers how to prevent themselves and their colleagues from making bad mistakes and then the department rewards that good behavior. Then we get to a point in history when our culture changes, we have fewer bad acts, fewer lawsuits, the culture is changing and so that's, that's the goal we want to accomplish. Then the citizen perceptions of police change and people are more apt to give information because they think we can do something about it and they think that we can actually protect them when we tell them we can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. I'm going to ask you a full part one question. <laughs> we, as my colleague just stated, we have this uh, elephant on the back of the police department known as the, what people call it the Gun Trace Task Force. Uh, if you're someone who's been around like me, you know that uh, those things started under a unit known as the Violent Crime Impact Section, which you and I discuss. Your predecessor, uh, refused to to give to the council's public safety committee even after the direction of the city solicitor information about active open uh, bpd cases into uh, individuals we didn't ask for identifying information just where they where folks were assigned in the department around the gun trace task force a couple questions will you commit to having those internal investigations wrapped up before the end of this fiscal year can we expect to see a commitment from you uh, to the uses of early warning uh, systems and other technologies to prevent this in the future? And also, uh, how will you uh, work with the city council in regards to the legislation that's pending in Annapolis around local control of the police department? Because I am, and all, actually all 15 members of the council are in belief that Baltimore can no longer be the only local jurisdiction in the country does not does fully control its own police department. Um, the internal affairs cases, and so certainly there's a deep dive assessment I have to make there to make sure that that, that can function the way it's supposed to function, that it can Four produce. Four questions, Councilman. I think, I think I have three. IA cases, early warning, local control. What was the fourth one? Yep, you get Yes, sir, that's it. That's three, okay. No, yeah, he said three is, is he said four is three. All right. Um, I, I have to make sure up. that internal affairs can function the way it's designed to function, that it's actually seeking the truth and that there are no barriers to an investigator seeking the truth, but the investigators actually have the appropriate skill sets to get that truth and they have the technology and the resources to do that and that there are no barriers that prevents them from doing that. So that's a deep dive assessment I have to do there to make sure that that's, number one, properly staffed with the people who have the right skill set that produces the right outcome so that justice is done. Either, the, either we find the truth and we hold the person accountable or we find the truth and we realize that the officer did what he or she was supposed to do. Um, and that's number one. And then finding a way to be transparent about that in a way that does not compromise investigations or compromise the integrity of an investigation or become an impediment to an investigation. Um, there, I think there's a way to oversee that and have monitoring of that that doesn't compromise. I, we have to figure out in partnership what we agree to talk about and how to maintain some level of secrecy to make sure. Now, th but that, that we're not violating the law at the same time. Make sure that I'm complying with the law. Um, regarding early warning, those things are being are being built and there's an early warning or an early intervention system that's being built as part of the consent decree. It's a very expensive piece of technology that will interface and make sure all the technologies are synchronizing and interfacing to identify patterns for officers, both good and bad, so that we can um, issue commendations when necessary but then enter Vene before bad acts and then deal with the bad acts after they happen in the appropriate way. But what we want to do is make sure that when we see changes in, in organizational and personal performance, that we can intervene and put officers back on the correct course so that we can have fewer of those disciplinary actions in internal affairs and in local control. You know, I, I think I said this earlier, I want to make sure I have the resources to do the job as the police chief, make the necessary reform, and bring the expertise that I bring without having any barriers of making that reform or obstacles in making that reform. And so that I have the, the authority and the autonomy to do that as an, an appointed police chief by the mayor 
to bring about that outcome of reforming a department, increasing citizen satisfaction, and bringing down crime, uh, and that we can do all that at the same time, and that we can get the resources we need to do that. And so however I get that, that authority and that control is what I'm in favor of as, as, the, as the police commission appointed by the mayor. I just want to make sure that no barriers are, are impediments that allow me to bring that to bear. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Commissioner, I, I just want to personally um, welcome you and your wife, because I don't think I have done that, um, to Baltimore. Um, and I heard loud and clear from the nine community meetings that we had throughout the city um, from the citizens. Um, and I think that they have spoken. I think they had expressed to us in all nine of the community meetings their desires to have you move forward um, as commissioner of Baltimore City Police Department. We had a few who had, you know, um, some, you know, um, pushback, but the majority of the folk, I went to all nine, thank you for um, was very favorable. So I just want to thank you and your wife for your commitment. Thank you for giving up a career to come here to Baltimore. Um, you all just didn't come here and got an apartment. You're looking at a home, and you made a commitment to make Baltimore your home. And the only thing I mentioned to you, uh, Mr. Interim Commissioner, was that I wanted you to be committed to the contract and stay and not leave in a couple years. And you assured me that you would do that by looking to purchase a home in the city of Baltimore. And I commend you for that. So um, I heard loud and clear from the citizens. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I just had to put that out there. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Commissioner, I want to talk a little bit about uh, consistent and sustained drug dealing in certain locations throughout the city. Um, too often the response from BPD in the past has been that um, we can't do anything about it and that's been somewhat related to or explained to be related to the consent decree. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, this type of activity in residential neighborhoods has created a huge quality of life issue um, for residents and what the department's approach under your leadership is going to be to address these types of issues uh, again sustained drug dealing in, in concentrated locations and neighborhoods i've you know i heard that at all nine meetings and the community members kind of overwhelmingly told me that um what i can tell you is that when i talk to the officers um they will tell me what I think they've told you, that the consent decree keeps me from doing certain things. Now, it, it absolutely does not. Me being able to explain it as the commissioner is very different from the skill set of a young police officer who probably can't explain it the way I'm about to explain it. But it just makes sure that we do our jobs in a constitutional way. And the consent decree is a, a number of administrative processes that really is an administrative burden on the department right now because we're really understaffed, but it brings about a number of administrative processes that's really designed to make us a well-run department, but those administrative processes make us have to slow down to accomplish those processes to do the job the right way. And I think the consent decree is just making us demonstrate by documenting that we did the thing and we did the thing the correct way, whatever that thing is, that we did it the correct way, and perhaps that's something we didn't always do, we had that same experience in New Orleans. And so I'm hearing people say that, and, but, but I know what it is they mean when they say it. They don't mean that they, the consent decree keeps me from doing my job. They are now in a position where they don't really have the confidence to do the job, is what I'm hearing them say, but not saying it that way. And what I'm hearing them say indirectly is that they believe the department and the department of justice will not support them and they have a high fear of getting in trouble for making minor mistakes that's translated the consent decree is keeping me from doing my job um and so that's what i'm hearing an educational campaign within the department to overcome those fears and to show that we do have their back especially when they're doing the right thing and that everything doesn't have to be disciplined but we accomplish a lot with training we want to make sure we deliver both competence and confidence in the police officers. When that happens and when we do that, fewer people will, 
will, will tell you that the consent decree is keeping us from doing this. What, what the next iteration will probably be, we can't do as much of it as fast as we used to do it. Thank you. And then I guess I'll just say this, um, at those uh, community meetings, forums that you had, I found that overwhelmingly the conversation from the community associations, the community leaders, or just individual citizens was they want to see community engagement and yes. community policing from the police department. Yes. They stress that they want to help you. They, they have, all of them just kept reaching out, but they want, there's been pushback in the past from the police department in actually engaging the community as a whole. And we now have a off, uh, mayor's office of African-American male engagement that has a strong force and a message to go on these corners and try to um, figure out whether the person needs a job, whether it's a mental health issue. The police, that's engagement with the police as well. And as I said before, the police department in the past has not been engaged. How are you going to weed out the ones that are not going to be engaged if it comes down to that? Oh, I'm, I'm smiling because I, I've heard this very same question uh, in, in other departments, especially in, in the New Orleans Police Department. And it really talks to police organizational culture. And, and, and you bring up such a point, but it's, a really, a, it's really, really a deep-rooted point that, that drives a lot of police organizations that some are beginning to overcome now. And it is the, the reward system. And so we have traditionally only valued enforcement and we only rewarded enforcement. How many drug dealers can you arrest? How many guns can you get? How many car chases you're in? And then we reward that, and all of our reward ceremonies and all of our celebratory things that we do have always been culturally, not here in BPD, but everywhere, has always been to reward the person who can produce the most. Um, but the question that I learned young in my career was who is who by far is the better officer, the officer who can arrest the most people or the officer who can prevent the most crime? And you talk about arresting the most people, but then you actually pre prevent victimization. So you, if one arrests 20 people for robbing 20 victims and one prevented 20 people from becoming victims, it's a paradigm shift in how to look at that. So it's a balance of recognizing the good work that the men and women do on a day-to-day -day basis with enforcement, but the value has to shift to put, putting value on relationship building and making people safe and making people feel safe and having some reward to that. That's a cultural shift that will take time, that it's a heavy lift. But good, informed, highly trained leaders who buy in will be able to have other people who are following them learn and have an appreciation for that over time. Uh, but, but that's something that we really have to focus on, but it comes through education. Looking forward to working with you and helping you to move Baltimore forward. Thank you. Okay, before we finish, we have another speaker, Mrs. Lisa Molak. This is the, our last um, speaker. At the podium right here. Can you pull a mic down so we can hear you yeah, also? First of all, I would like to thank you for coming to Baltimore. Thank you so much. Um, talk, my name can is you Lisa talk in the mic? We are, oh, I'm sorry, talk this way? In the mic. Okay, I'm from No One Left Unhelp. Um, we have a, a program for children of murdered parents as well as their families. Um, we try to help them to just channel their grief while they're going through their transition. And a lot of the children, some lost one parent, some lost two. That's an L group. And um, a lot of the cases go unsolved. So I know one thing that affects the family a lot, a lot of the families is they have issues getting information from the detectives maybe after a year. Most of them tell me like the case is closed, they feel like it's been dropped. Is there anything that you will do to open them cases back up or maybe have someone view Can't them old no cases? Question. You got to talk to us, you can't ask Okay. Me 
Um, I'm trying to ask them, is there any way that we're going to find out if someone will reach out to the families for some of the cold cases that it's been years since their loved ones and they haven't heard from the detectives? Is there anything that we're going to do to try to help these families? Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Commissioner? <laughs> That's our last um, testimony, so this committee will be taking a vote. Is there a motion to recommend Michael S. Harrison for Commissioner of so Baltimore moved. City Police? So moved by Councilman Slifer, second by Councilman Burnett. Stokes is a yes, Councilman Burnett. Yes. Councilwoman Clark. Yes. Councilman Cohen. Yes. Councilman Schleifer. Yes. The motion passed. The committee will recommend a favorable report for Mr. Harrison's nomination. The nomination will be placed on second reading on Monday, March 11th, 2019. The full council will review and take a vote at that time. Mr. Harrison, on behalf of the mayor and the city council of Baltimore, I would like to thank you for your willingness to serve the citizens of Baltimore. If there is no other business, this committee is adjourned.